The book of Ephesians may have been an encyclical letter that was given first as a recipient to the church in Ephesus, which was then passed on to the next churches after. And this may have also been written sometime in the early 60s AD, while Paul was traditionally believed to be in prison at Rome when this was written. Now, in our study sometime last year, we've come to learn that every single chapter, which sums up to six chapters of Ephesians, the first three is theological, which simply means that it is speaking strictly about theology. It teaches us how Christ is going to unite all things under his leadership, under his dominion. And when we get to chapters four to six, it speaks about what are we going to do with this theology? Knowing that Christ is reigning, knowing that we've been predestined, knowing that we have been sealed by the Spirit as a down payment, knowing that we've been raised to life with Christ, what do we do with this theology? Well, chapters 4, 5, and 6 speaks about theology being put to practice, where there is unity involved, chapters 4. Not wasting our time, chapters 4. The use of the tongue, chapters 4. Chapters 5, do not waste time or be unwise. Chapter 5, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And wives, submit to your husbands as the bride of Christ submits to Christ. And in chapter 6, how does that theology look like when we are in warfare? We become strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. But I want to focus our attention in chapter 2. And though chapters 1 or chapters 2 verses 1 to 10 speak about the grace of God being put to action for making men who are dead spiritually being brought to life, I want to focus on a very important theme and key word in Ephesians. It is the word walk. And that will be the title of this evening's message, Walking in Ephesians. Walking in Ephesians. Now, what do we mean by walking? Well, you're going to see this shortly. In verse 1, the Apostle Paul is now about to unpack for us how Christ is truly reigning and how he demonstrates this power both in the cosmic and on earth. He says in verse 1, And you, speaking to the church, were dead in your transgressions and sins. Which is just another way of saying we were cut off, alienated from the life of God. And a man who is dead has no ability whatsoever to hear. He has no life residing in him. He is unable to do anything whatsoever because he is dead. In verse 2, how do dead men live? How do dead men formerly walk? As what's mentioned here. In which you formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also formally conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. The question might be, what does the word walk here mean? Notice the words, you formerly walked. When the word formerly is used here, it's not speaking of the present, God forbid. It is speaking of the past. Our past life, we, when we were cut away, alienated, severed from the life of God because of our sins and transgressions. Now, in the Bible, there is a few terms concerning about how the word walk is used semantically. For example, in the Gospels, Jesus walked with his disciples on the shores of Galilee. That's literally walking. Furthermore, when Jesus healed the man who was crippled and could not walk, he ended up picking his mat and literally walked. Furthermore, when we also see Peter and John in the book of Acts chapter 3 at the gates of beautiful, what did they do? Silver and gold have I none, but one thing I do have is, the, is this. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So here, the usage of walk is physical. It's literal. They literally walked. But because we are in the context of one spiritual condition, 
What could the word walk mean here? Well, the Bible says, in which you formerly walked. Now, in the Bible, in its entirety, whether it's Old or New Testament, you will see, beloved, that whenever the word walk is used, it's always referring to one's life conduct towards God or towards the world. For example, in Genesis chapter 5, as I just quoted to you, beloved, one of the first men to walk with God was Enoch in Genesis chapter 5. He was the seventh man from gener the generation of Adam. And the Bible says at the age of 65, he started to walk with God for 300 years. Now, as I remind you, beloved, God is a spirit. How can you literally, physically walk with a spirit? So the walk there is not literal or physical. It's another way of saying he lived for God for 300 years. And after that 300-year walk, the Bible says God took him. And then in the book of Psalms, chapter 1, we see that King David goes on to begin that chapter of Psalms by saying, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor walks or stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Three things that are mentioned there. Walk, stands, sits. It's another way of saying to compromise, to live like, to conduct oneself after that very form of pattern of living. And when you get to the New Testament, this is what's interesting. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If any man will come after me, he must not walk in darkness. John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who is also the author of 1 John, also tells us, if any man says he knows Christ, but does not walk the way that Jesus walked, he is a liar. So we see this word walk, which is a key word and theme throughout the Bible in the context of lifestyle. So here we see that when Paul uses the words, you formerly walk, it is synonymous and interchangeable to the words of verse 3. And what is that? Among whom we also formerly conducted ourselves. So notice formerly is used in verse 2. Then formerly again is used in verse 3. But instead of the word walked that's used in verse 2, it uses the word conducted. Now, from a technical perspective, if you bear with me, the word walk that is used here, according to its ancient literature, is the word peripateo. And the word peripateo simply means to pattern one's life in a sphere that they're in. Now, according to verse 1, when a person is dead in their sins, they're under the sphere of the wrath of God. They're under the sphere of of the world and when a person is under the sphere of the world which leads to transgressions and sins their lifestyle according to the bible is they are walking according to the course of this world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life according to the ruler of the power of the air which means their lord their master is satan the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience so by contrast, in chapters 1, we were filled, sealed by the Spirit, but not always according to our former lives. We were not filled by the Spirit back then. We were not walking in the Spirit back then. We were walking and under the control and power of the prince of the ruler of the air, who is now currently, the Bible says, working in the hearts of men who live in disobedience. Verse 3, among whom we also formerly conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now it doesn't say, and we were by coincidence the children of wrath. We were by nature. Which means because we are fallen men of Adam, we have come from that old sphere of life under Adam, as he was our head when it comes to the curse and death, we were by nature the children of wrath. Now, it is often said, beloved, and you possibly have heard this too, in the context of soteriology, you will often hear the very teaching something like this. In order to be born again, you must first believe, and then you are regenerated. 
There are those who will say, you must first say the sinner's prayer, and then after that sinner's prayer, you're now born again. Congratulations. Welcome into the house of God. But when we read Ephesians 2, that is not the soteriological structure of the process and order of salvation for one to be born again. From verses 1 to 3, this is our condition. We're dead. There's no capability. There's no ability whatsoever to live for God. We are completely dead. However, there's a change that takes place. Two key words that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones used on his sermon, just two words from Ephesians 2.4. He says, but God. There's a change that takes place. We were dead. We were under Satan's domain. We were under the spirit of the power of the air. We were being worked on and worked by, by the spirit of disobedience. But something happened. Dead men don't get out of the graves on their own. Lazarus, three, four days in the tomb, could not get out of that tomb on his own. But the Bible says, But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So whenever we sing Amazing Grace, or whenever we quote verse 8, when it says, For by grace you have been saved, People just, just tend to limit this to, it's not your works, it's just God's work, which is true. But the question is, what did God do for it to be called grace? When we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound, what do we mean by that? Why is it a sweet sound theologically? That saved a wretch like me, what was our condition then that makes an amazing grace? Number one, we were dead. Number two, but God raised us up together with Christ. You will notice also in the Bible, beloved, that everything has to come through Jesus and by Jesus. A good example is John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Why through Him? Because through Jesus and in Jesus is life. That's why it mentions here in verse 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with who? With Christ. God's agent of bringing dead men to life by the power of the Holy Spirit is through and by Christ. It is our union with Christ that causes us to be born again. Without Christ, there's no life. Without Christ, there's no eternal life. Without Christ, we remain dead in our transgressions and sins. Yet, in verse 6, you will notice something called the already and not yet eschatology of Paul. What do we mean by that? Verse 6, And raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, why is this called the already and not yet eschatology of Paul? Already means something that we're experiencing now. And not yet, something that has not been fully consummated or fully experienced to its perfection. For example, what is the already that Paul's talking about here? We were raised up with him. In what way? Verse 1 says you're dead. Verse 4 says, all the way to verse 6, you're raised up. You are regenerated. You're born again. So that's the already. That's the present. But what's interesting is it says here, it doesn't stop there. And he has now seated us with him in the heavenly places. Now, what on earth does our brother Paul mean by this? We're on the earth. How on earth are we in heaven at the same time? And the simple answer to this is our union with the cosmic Christ. We are raised up with him as he was raised, we are raised. However, as he went to heaven, in one sense... We have been seated with Him in heaven, though we have not yet fully experienced it just yet. This is the already and not yet eschatology of Paul. The already is we are experiencing His blessings. We are experiencing being raised with Christ. We are experiencing this salvation. But to its completion, we have not yet received all of it. What is the not yet? The new heaven, new earth. We have not yet received that. 
our glorified bodies to be changed and transformed. We has not yet received that. Us physically being where He is, to be seated where He is, we're not there yet. But because of our close union with Christ, in the mind of God, in the mind of our living God, it's already being realized. How that works, we simply do not know. That is a mystery. But one thing is for certain, the already and not yet tension is here, but it makes perfectly great sense in the mind of our God. So why does he do this? Verse 7, so that in the ages to come, not now, but in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What is not of works? What is not of ourselves? The raising from the dead is not from us. To be seated with Christ in the already and not yet is definitely not from us. To be released from the domain and sphere of Satan, who is the ruler and power of the air, who is now currently working in the sons of disobedience, we didn't free ourselves. Jesus says, no man can come to me unless the Father draws him. Even our Lord says, him whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Can we free ourselves? Absolutely not. Now here's the beautiful part. After he mentions verses 8 and 9, what is the purpose of Christ raising us from the dead? Verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, notice this, so that we would walk in them. What do you notice about verses 1, or verse 2, and verse 10? They both have the word walk. What does that mean? It means there is a literary sandwich that has just occurred. In grammar, especially in exegetical grammar, exegetical observation, and the structure of passages, there is something called inclusio. What is an inclusio? When we study the structure of a chapter or passages or chiasm, however we want to look into it, what is an inclusio? An inclusio is when it begins off with a certain keyword or subject or topic, and it ends it off with the same word or same topic. For example, in verse 2, you formerly walked. This is your past life. But because God raised you from the dead, this is how you ought to walk now. So Paul is telling the church in Ephesus, or whoever was the recipient of it, this is how you live then. But because you have experienced the amazing grace of God, being raised together with Christ, this is how you ought to walk now. This is how you ought to live now. Now, of course, the question might be, when was this prepared? The Bible says in verse 10, which God prepared beforehand. There is a predestinarian theology going on here. And it shouldn't be no strange thing to us, beloved, because in Ephesians 1, in the great doxology of Paul, the great eulogy, praise be to God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who caused us to receive all these spiritual blessings in heavenly places. For we were chosen in Him, when? Before the foundation of the world. So in the eternal mind of God, all these things have been realized, but it has not yet occurred in time. We have experienced resurrection. We have experienced salvation. We have experienced the grace of God and faith and repentance. And yet, look what the Bible says. He has raised us up because we are His workmanship. Now, when I was studying this word workmanship, I started to ask, Lord, what on earth does this mean, workmanship? Does this mean just to work? Or does this mean that we're some form of clay that God is building, molding, and etc.? Jeremiah talks about it. Romans 9 talks about it. He is the potter, we are the clay. But here, the word workmanship literally means, according to his ancient literature, we are his creation. We are his creation. And the word that was used for the word workmanship is the Greek word poiema. 
And the word poiema literally means something that was produced, something that is created. So here we see you were dead, but in order to bring life in you, something had to be produced in you. Something had to be created. And if that is not interesting, what's more interesting to this is the connection of that word workmanship to the Greek Old Testament in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Where it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you know what was the word that was used for the word created in the Greek Septuagint of Genesis 1 verse 1? The same word that was used here. For we are his workmanship. Now, Paul could have used another Greek word for created, which is ketisis. That's the common word for creation. But he chose to use a word poema or poeo for this. Why? Because he knew that his readers, who may have been familiar with the Greek Septuagint, understood that when the word apoiason, or created, is used in Genesis 1, it speaks of God's creative activity and work. So whatever occurred in Genesis 1 is called the old creation order. But look at this. Under the old creation order, we were dead because of Adam. So in order to produce a new creation, he had to raise us up through who? Through Christ Jesus. That's why the Bible says if any man be in Christ, what happens? He is a brand new creature. Some translations say creation. Why creation? Because it, it you see, salvation and conversion is more than 50% change. It's more than just a revision of here and there. It's more than just partial editing. Conversion is a brand new heart. A brand new spirit. Born again. And that's the beauty, beloved, of what's taking place here. So because God has created in us a brand new man through Christ as the agent and the mediator. Notice what he uses here next. After workmanship, he uses the common word that I used, that, that I spoke earlier, that word ketesis. He says, created in Christ Jesus for good works. What does that mean? God produces new creatures in salvation. Only alone in Christ. No man can be a new creature unless he's in Christ. No man can be raised from spiritual death unless he's in Christ. No man can live unto the good works that God has prepared beforehand unless he is in Christ. So notice why the translators use workmanship and created. But in its literal form, it works like this. For we are his creation. Created in Jesus Christ, prepared for good works. So notice verse 2, you formerly walked, that's your past life. But because of God, verse 4, verse 10 says, so that we would walk in them. Now because the title of this message is Walking in Ephesians, is this the only time that the word walk is used in Ephesians? So there are five things I want to share with you, beloved, that I pray would be an encouragement to you. Because the question might be, how does this look like? What does it mean to walk in those good works that God has prepared for us beforehand? Number one, the good works that God is referring to here is to walk worthy of the calling. To walk worthy of the calling. In chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, Chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Look at what the Bible says. Therefore, I, the prisoner in the Lord, exhort you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Well, hold on. Who called us? God. When? Well, He called us before the foundation of the world, but it was initiated in His perfect time. Prepare to do what? To do good works. In what manner? To walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. So how does this walking worthy look like? When a person is born again, this is the walk of worthiness that God has prepared for us in which he has called us. Verse 2, with all humility. 
and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So to walk worthy is not to quote how many verses in the Bible or to do this or to do that. The Bible says to walk worthy, at least in this context, is to walk in humility and gentleness with a goal to strive of keeping the peace. So we may not know everything about the Bible. We may not be, we could say, eloquent as others, such as other sisters or brothers in Christ. But if you are striving to aim at the peace and preserve the peace, we are walking worthy. Because that is what the text is saying. So the first walk that prepares us for good works is to walk worthy. To keep the unity through means of humility and gentleness. Number two. The second walk is found in verse 17. To walk in good works is to not walk like the Gentiles. Chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, this I say and testify in the Lord, that you walk no longer, just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. So when a person is born again, he is called to walk worthy, and as he walks worthy, a part of that worthy walking or living is not to go back into the lifestyle that we once lived. So he says that you walk no longer, just as the Gentiles also walk. The term Gentile is just another way of saying, well, two things really. The first one being someone who is not really a Jew, ethnically. But Gentile, by nature, is someone who has no covenant with Yahweh. So what Paul is saying here, since you have been raised with Christ, don't live a life as if you don't know Yahweh. You don't know Christ. That you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. And how do they live? In the futility of their mind. This is in contrast to what Paul tells the Roman church. Be not conformed to this world, but be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Or be transformed by the renewing of your mind. While those who are futile, those who are walking like Gentiles, those who live the Gentile life, they don't think about the things of God. They think only about the things of the flesh. For he that is in the flesh thinketh only about the things of the flesh. But he that is in the Spirit minds only the things of the Spirit. So here we are not called to live in the futility of our minds like the Gentiles. Number three. When one is born again, they walk in love. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 to chapter 5 verse 2. Let's read it. Ephesians 4 32 to chapters 5 verse 2. Instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also graciously forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as our fragment aroma so what does it mean to walk in love to walk in love beloved as men who are raised from spiritual death to life is to be imitators of god and what does it mean to be an imitator of god what does it mean to live like god what does it mean to walk after his plan and pattern well you're kind to one another tender-hearted graciously forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has graciously forgiven us. How do I know that I've been raised with Christ? Your enemies, you view them not as enemies, but as souls who need Jesus. And therefore, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are willing to forgive them, willing to pray for them, willing to do all for the sake of the gospel to win them over to Christ. But a person who has not been raised to life from spiritual death what does John say? The one who commits murder is the one who has hatred for his brother. And the one who has hatred for his brother has not yet passed from death 
unto life. So this teaches us something. All the theology that was mentioned in chapters 1, 2, and 3 go down the drain unless we walk in love. This is the problem of the Corinthian church as well. They had gifts, they had wisdom, they had knowledge, they had eloquence of speech. And yet Paul says, unless you have love, we are nothing. So that is the fourth walk that's mentioned here. Walk in love or third walk. The fourth walk that's mentioned in Ephesians is in chapter 5, verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are in the light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That's powerful, beloved. He teaches us not to walk like the Gentiles. He teaches us to walk in love. Now he's calling us to walk and live as children of light. What does it mean to be a child of light? Well, this echoes what our Lord and Savior Jesus says in the book of Matthew. You are the salt and light of this world. Earlier, we quoted John 8, 12. Jesus says, I am the light of this world. If any man walks and follows after me, he shall never walk in darkness. So to be a child of the light is to no longer live in the sphere of darkness. To walk as children of light. So how does that look like? Verse 9. For the fruit of that light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. So what consists of light living, so to speak? Goodness, the goodness of God in Scripture. Righteousness, the ways of God in Scripture. And the truth of God, what He wants to reveal to us in Scripture. And when these three elements is, is what we walk by, then we learn what is pleasing to God, and what we learn what is pleasing to God, and we apply this in our lives, we don't participate in the unfruitful works of darkness. If there's no goodness from God, if there's no righteousness from God, if there's no truth in God, then we become vulnerable to walk in the unfruitful works of darkness. Why is it called unfruitful? Because it does not produce any honor or praise or glory to our God. Lastly, as men who have been prepared beforehand to do good works, we are called to live careful and to be wise. Verse 15 of chapter 5. Ephesians 5, verse 15. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil, on account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So we are called to walk in good works. That good work is a call to walk worthy, to walk not like the Gentiles, to walk in love, to walk as children of light, and lastly, to walk carefully as wise. The word carefully is not to say you're looking right or left physically as you're walking, but it's another way of saying that you're keeping the Word of God as center of your life, that you don't want to grieve His Holy Spirit. Because we have already read earlier in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So in order for us not to grieve the Holy Spirit, we have to walk carefully, not as unwise, but as wise. Unwise, according to Ephesians 5, is someone who doesn't take opportunity of the time that God has given him. He's not redeeming the time. Secondly, he is completely aware, unaware, and foolish that the days are evil. Thirdly, he doesn't understand what the Lord's will is because he is unwise. 
But when a person is careful in how they walk, which simply means, Lord, I want to know what you have me to do today. Reveal to me in your word what is pleasing in your sight. As every minute, every second is ticking, I do not want to grieve your Holy Spirit. Teach me thy ways that I may walk careful during this time of evil, during this time of those who live in revelry, or we can say ungodly and unfruitful works. So here we see that when the Bible says, but God has raised us to life with Christ, there's a reason. The whole thing that is being referred to here is this very lesson. Jesus saved you, not so that you can just remain saved, but that you can walk as new creatures in Christ Jesus to glorify Him until we have not yet received that not yet eschatology that Paul was talking about. So when God raises us from death to life, He doesn't say, you're saved, do whatever you want. No. The Bible says you are commanded to walk worthy. Walk not like the Gentiles. Walk in love. Walk as children of light. Walk as wise. Why? Because we have been chosen before the foundation of the world. We have been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ by love and by His holiness. We have been atoned for by our Lord Jesus. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit as a down payment. This is just another way of saying that God loves us because God's glory comes first before all things. And in this manner, this is how God has glorified Himself, to save wretched sinners such as you and I, so that the more we walk with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, we no longer reg recognize who we are. We become more and more conformed to the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. This evening, beloved, I pray that we have come to understand what walking literally in Ephesians mean. Walking in Ephesians is another of saying, how does someone who used to walk in the sphere of darkness, now that he's been raised to life, how does that raised man to life look like when he lives for God? He walks worthy. He walks not like the Gentiles. He walks in love. He walks as a child of light. He walks as wise. And who does all of that? The same God that raised us up. Not by works, lest any man should boast. The same God that filled us with the Spirit. The same God that has chosen us before the foundation of the world. He is our author and perfecter of faith. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we like to thank you, Lord, for the word of the Lord that you have granted us this evening. First and foremost, we seek for your forgiveness. If we did not walk according to your ways, if we did not live up to what a person who is a new creature in Christ ought to live, we seek for your forgiveness. Teach us to walk worthy. Teach us to walk not like the Gentiles in the futility of their mind. Teach us, O God, to walk in love, to walk as children of light, and to walk not as unwise, but as wise. Because, Lord, we want to please you. We want to walk in the good works that you have prepared for us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. We want to honor you with our lives as men who were raised from spiritual death to life as a product of God's grace, mercy, and love wrought in Christ Jesus. That's why, Lord, we give you all the praise and honor that you rightfully deserve. Help us walk the way that you walked. Help us live the way that you live, that we may bring glory to the one who deserves it, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for the Word of God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. As we offer our Lord a hymn of response, Amazing Grace, hymn 423. Him for.